Good morning and welcome to our service from Ballycraigie Congregational Church this morning. It's really good to have you with us today and we give you a very warm welcome indeed. If you're one of our regular folks, it's really good to have you with us and uh, we're, we're glad that you could come along today. Uh, if you're not uh, one of our regular folks, it's great to have you join with us today as well and we trust that you will enjoy our service today. In these uncertain times, it's really good to know that we can trust in an unchanging God. And there's a little verse in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, which says, Casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. And he cares for you exactly where you're at at the minute. Whatever anxieties or problems or issues you're worried about today, that God is concerned about you. And due to this uh, pandemic, which we're currently facing, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern about today. Uh, but God knows all about what's going on. He knows all about what's going on in your life. He wasn't taken by surprise. Uh, we've got a heavenly father, a loving heavenly father, who's in complete control. And he's in, in control of the circumstances of your life and what is going on around you. And if you know and love him, you know that you have that assurance of salvation. And you also have that assurance of his care, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he will be with you, irrespective of what life uh, throws at you. And just that we verse again, 1 Peter 5, verse 7, casting all your, all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Just at this point, we're going to open our time together uh, with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for this promise in your word that you're concerned about every area of our lives. We thank you, Lord, as we look around us today and we see uh, many challenges, Lord. We thank you that you're always with us and that you never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Lord, we have that assurance of your salvation, that uh, you promise, Lord, if we trust in you, that you'll be with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, we pray for those today who are particularly anxious. We just really pray for them, that you will be with them, and that they would know your help and your encouragement and your support, Lord, in these days. Help us as a congregation of your people to be concerned for one another, to be concerned about those around us, and to also uh, to do what we can to encourage and to pray for others and to be in contact with them uh, by phone or over uh, social media, just as best we can, Lord, just to get alongside people. We pray for those who are in the front line today. We just really pray for them, Lord. We pray for those in our NHS. Lord, we really thank you for it, and we thank you, Lord, for the, the good things that's going on in the NHS these days. We just pray, Lord, for the people that are there, that you would be with them, that you would help them, Lord, that you would encourage them, Lord, and that you would protect them, and that they would know, Lord, as they go into work each day, that you're with them and you're just really helping them and undertaking for them, Lord. We pray for those as well and are vital as food supply chain as well. We just pray for them, that you'd be with them, and that you'd really undertake for them too in these days, and that they would know your protection and help at this time. We pray for those who are teachers as well, Lord, who are maybe uh, finding difficulty, Lord, connecting with their students, or Lord, just trying to teach uh, over the internet, we just pray to be with them and really undertake. Pray for our students, Lord, who missed out on exams too, and the concerns that they have with that, and the concerns that they have for the future. Thank you, Lord, that you are concerned about our future, and you've told us, Lord, that we are to uh, give all our cares, Lord, over to you, Lord, and that you will look after us and you will care for us. We don't understand just why some things happen or what the future holds for us, but we know that you're in control, Lord, of our lives and that you're in control of the future as well. We just pray for our service today, Lord. We just pray uh, that you would just use uh, the children's talk as it goes out shortly, that you would just uh, be with our children and young people at this time. Pray for those that are particularly struggling, Lord, uh, with this period of isolation, that you would just be with them too and really undertake uh, for them as well. And Lord, we just pray for your word as Andy shares it later on, that you would just, Lord, uh, help us, Lord, to be open and to be receptive as to what you would have to say to us today. And pray to you, Lord, in these days, Lord, when we're, we don't have the same uh, busyness that we normally have in our lives, that we would take time, Lord, take time to get closer to you, Lord, to get into your word and to pray, Lord, and to really, Lord, experience, Lord, a deeper walk with you in these days. We just pray, Lord, you be with us now and really undertake for us, uh, for us in your name we ask it. Amen. As we already said, it's really good to have you with us today, and we give you a very warm welcome indeed. Uh, as part of our programme today, Andrew Quinn will be taking our children's talk uh, very shortly. 
and we'll also then be having a short song uh, with that uh, then as well. Uh, after that then, we've asked some of our folks uh, just to take part in short video clips, uh, just saying some of the things these days that they're thankful for, and also some of the things that uh, they would appreciate prayer for as well. And then following that, uh, Valerie McGowan is going to uh, lead us in prayer. Andrew Quinn will follow on uh, with the study from Mark's Gospel. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Uh, thanks for tuning in to, uh, to church today. I hope you've been enjoying listening to these, um, to church on screen, as it were, these past a couple of weeks and um, just to let you know that we're thinking about you we're praying for you and we miss you I just wish I was doing this talk uh, standing at the front of the church with you guys sitting on the front row and we could have more of a chat together but um, this is how it is just now and so I hope uh, that you're making the best of it been thinking about you during the week as well I just wonder how your days have been and how things have been for you at home um, for us, let, let, let me just give you a little sketch of what a day is like for us. Um, first thing in the morning, or the first part of the school day anyway, we do the PE class with Joe Wicks and really enjoying that uh, from nine till half nine, uh, getting ourselves a little bit more in shape. Certainly I need to get in shape. I actually only manage about three days out of the five because my old muscles are not very fit and uh, they get sore, And uh, but, but I have been enjoying it. Um, for that first half hour and then uh, and then there's a bit of school work goes on I don't take much to do with it but school happens from till maybe about half past 11 and that seems to 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 tick off that part of of the day and then I don't know people uh, do their own thing after that uh, if it's a good day everybody's it'll be a good day if everybody's agreeing and if everybody's happy but if there's a few fights go on it's not such a good day, but I'm sure there wouldn't be any fights in your house. Uh, but we're thinking about you anyway, and uh, maybe after that we, we would go out for a walk as well. Our Prime Minister has allowed us to go out once a day for a walk, and so it's nice to, to do that as well. And lots of other people seem to be out walking these days. Now, when I was, when I was thinking about what I would say to you, I was thinking about where I'm sitting here in our living room, is actually under the flight path into Belfast International Airport down there at Antrim. And uh, I was thinking about the different planes that come across. Whenever you look up, most often it's an EasyJet plane because a lot of the flights in and out of Belfast Airport are, are EasyJet planes. And it flies to over 30 different, EasyJet fly to over 30 different places, places like Venice in, in Italy or Bordeaux in the south of France, nice sunny places or more ordinary places, I suppose, like Glasgow and Liverpool, just over in England and Scotland. Um, there's another one. Anybody know what that airline is? Yeah, you can read it off the plane, I suppose. Jet 2, and uh, that would take you across Europe, uh, more of to uh, mostly to holiday locations, places like Vienna and Crete and Barcelona. You could go to Barcelona and watch a football game. There's another airline. Does anybody know what that one is? I used to travel by this airline from uh, Edinburgh to Dublin quite a lot. And you could go on the it from Belfast to uh, Manchester or Malta or Milan. You could go to Milan for shopping, but maybe not just at the minute. Um, another airline that comes in and out of Belfast International, I didn't know about this, but whizair.com. It's just has, it just flies from Belfast to one location, a place called Vinius or Vilnius, uh, which is the capital of Lithuania. And so if you wanted to go there, you could get whizair.com. That would take you over the clouds uh, to Lithuania. This one would go higher up into the sky because it's going all the way across the Atlantic to Orlando in Florida, down in the south of the USA. In, in that sunny place where, uh, sunny holiday location of, of uh, Florida. And one more, TUI, uh, takes um, like a package holiday plane, which takes place people across Europe to different locations around Europe. 
Why I was thinking about, about coming on the clouds or flying on the clouds was this verse, um, where it's a verse that comes from Mark chapter 14, and Jesus is being put on trial by some cruel people. And they're asking him questions and trying to trap him and trying to see if they could get some reason to put him to death. And uh, they ask him the question, are you the Christ? Are you the son of God? And he says, I am. And then he says, you will see the son of man uh, seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And uh, why I was thinking about that, why I was thinking about airplanes is this last little bit where Jesus says to these guys that one day they will see him coming with the clouds of heaven. And I was thinking about that and thinking when would that be and just thought about trying to explain that uh, to you uh, people. Uh, that, that, that at the end of time, one day in the future, Jesus, who was here and who we think about dying on the cross and being... Uh, uh, going th being raised to life at the resurrection, this same Jesus promised and promises uh, to come back again. And how he's going to come is not on an easy jet plane, but uh, he doesn't need that, but he will come with the clouds of heaven in some sort of visual way so as everybody on the, in, in the whole earth can see him. People will be surprised uh, when he comes, because it says that people will be, you know, carrying on with their own things. They'll be playing and they'll be working. They'll be studying. They'll be doing all sorts of just ordinary things like being married and uh, just carrying on with life as normal. And then one day he will come. It says elsewhere in the Bible that um, that that there will be a shout from the from the chief angel, what's described as the archangel. He'll give a shout as Jesus is coming. It says that trumpets will be sounded to, to let people know that he's coming. But he will come on the clouds of heaven. And uh, uh, we don't know when. It could be today. We always have to think like that. It could be today. It may not be for a few more sleeps. Or it may not be for a really long time. It may not even be until your next birthday. Or it may not be like until you're old. We just, we, we just don't know when he would come, but we do know he's coming. And he's coming with the clouds of heaven. And when it says that in the Bible, one, it, it, it's comforting for us, especially comforting if things are going wrong, because we know that they won't always go wrong. Because one day Jesus is coming back, uh, and that will be a happy time for God's people, a very happy time for God's people. But the crucial thing is that we would be ready for his coming. I'm going to sing a song in a minute or two that talks about being ready and helps us to know how we would be ready. But that's the most important thing. And how can we be ready? Well, before he comes back, we need to have put our trust in the Lord Jesus to, as our Savior. And that means that we're ready for his coming. And so as we don't know when he's coming, we need to put our trust in Jesus now so as we're ready uh, for him to come. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Thank you. Let's enjoy this song together.
back again So here's the truth in this simple tune We should always watch and pray And we'll be glad when the Lord comes back If we trust in Him today Garth here just want to share a few quick points for praise and for prayer um, our points for praise are I suppose things that we would have taken for granted until just a few weeks ago so um, that is of course our health uh, and also the uh, the ability to carry on with our jobs um, which I know not everyone has the uh, the privilege of doing just at the minute and we're certainly grateful for that and um, something else that we would have taken for granted until recently is uh, our teachers and anyone who's doing any homeschooling will understand that we'd certainly appreciate prayer uh, for patience in that and in helping Jean Juglin working from home a few days a week and uh, and looking after the kids. Hello everyone. Um, just at this time something that we could be praising God for really is our technology and the ability that we have to be able to communicate with each other and being able to hear the sermons, join the prayer meetings, all at this time of isolation. I enjoy my work, so I'm thankful that I still have that to go out to. Even though it's a bit strange at the minute, I still enjoy it. And I'm thankful that the post service, um, all those guys are still working as well because they have just delivered me my Rent Collective I Choose to Worship album. So I'm going to put that on in the car, I'm going to head out to work. So I'm thankful at this time for the technology that we have and the the ability we, that gives us to meet together and to, to still continue to, to meet as a church even at a time when we can't meet together physically. Certainly I would appreciate prayer with regard to work, the risks involved there and the decisions that have to be made as well. And we would of course value your prayers uh, with regard to uh, our ongoing good health and, and we'll certainly be praying for the congregation and those who particularly have underlying conditions or who uh, are anxious about their health, particularly at this time. Um, we'd certainly value your prayers in, in that regard too, so thanks. And something we could pray for are those people that probably don't have access to that technology. Um, and are feeling very alone and vulnerable at the minute. Um, pray for our older people in our congregation and our older members of our families who probably are suffering a little bit more through that isolation. So these are things just to bear in mind this time. I'm praying at this time for protection for myself and all my colleagues and all the customers coming in and out of the store, people who are on the move and need things to do, need to get out and do shopping. I'm just praying for everybody and for safety for all. I'm thinking and praying a lot at the minute about those that are are living alone, those that are and those that are self isolating, and just that they would know God's comfort and fellowship at a time when family and friends can't be about as much, but that they'll have the support they need through this time when when people are needing to self isolate. Hello everyone. In a moment we are going to pray together but first I just wanted to let you know that we're thinking of you all much and praying for our Ballycraigie church family in these days. At this time it's good that we try to keep in touch and connect with each other whether through email or text or a phone call or a card or a letter. We really do need each other and maybe um, more so in these days. As many of you know, this is Palm Sunday, which marks the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. In Matthew 21 and 10, it says, 
And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, asking, Who is this? May many in these days ask who Jesus is, and may many find him. Let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning acknowledging that you are God and Lord over all. We thank you that you are high in the heavens and yet at the same time as close to us as our next breath. We thank you that in your word you have promised to provide for us and to protect us and in this we take great comfort. Through this difficult time we ask that you would cradle us in your loving arms and carry us through these days of uncertainty. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we take our eyes off you. In these times, we can become so easily shaken and overwhelmed. Help us to remember that we can come to you at any time of the night or the day when we find ourselves anxious or afraid, knowing that you care so deeply for us. Thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. This morning, we want to remember those from our church family who are sick and needing a special touch of grace. We bring them lovingly to you and ask that they may know and experience your peace and comfort in a very real way at this time. We think especially of those who have had their treatment plans interrupted owing to the situation with this virus. And we simply ask that you would minister graciously to them at this time. We remember those who live alone and we pray that they wouldn't feel lonely, that they might rest in you, knowing that you are a close companion and a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Today, we want to remember all those who are working tirelessly on the front line. Lord, strengthen and protect them from all harm. Be with them and their families. Go with them as they start on their day's work and walk beside them throughout. We pray for our NHS and our government that you would grant wisdom and discernment to those that would try to steer us through this time. We thank you for your word and the many promises that it contains. Help us in these days to be more committed to studying it more diligently and in so doing that our souls would be nourished and our minds strengthened. Thank you for our pastor and our diaconate. We ask that you would be with each one of them, equipping them for the task that you have called them to. Grant them wisdom and discernment in all the decisions they have to consider and make at this time regarding our fellowship. We thank you that your word has been able to go out online over these last few weeks, and we pray that many would be blessed by it and that your kingdom would be extended. Thank you for the opportunities that we have had to connect with each other remotely through the likes of Zoom and email. We do miss meeting together and we pray and long for the day when we can do so again. So Lord, thank you for who you are and all that you mean to us. We leave all these things in your gracious care and keeping. Amen. Well, good morning again and thanks to Peter for, his, for, the, for the words of welcome at the beginning and to Valerie for leading us in prayer. I want to turn to a portion of Mark's Gospel. Towards the end of the Gospel, we just jump ahead of ourselves for these two weeks to look at um, Mark chapter 14, some verses there uh, today, and then uh, next week on Easter Sunday morning, we look at something um, that focuses our minds on the resurrection. So for this week, it's the, it's the Thursday evening of what we... Um, uh, have come to call Holy Week, I suppose. This uh, week that we're going into now, leading up to, to Easter, um, we're familiar with the Lord's, uh, with, the, with the Last Supper, and uh, Jesus met with his disciples to celebrate the Last Supper. And then after that, he went out to the garden at Gethsemane late on the Thursday evening. In Mark 14, beginning at well, verse 53, really, but let's read in from 51 just to get this little biographical statement by Mark. And the young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. 
But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none, for many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard this bla his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you're a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the, the rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Well, as I say, it, 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 it's a scene that happens on the Thursday night. Earlier they had had the Last Supper. Then he prayed in the, gar in the garden at Gethsemane. Uh, quite late in the evening by this stage it would seem and and very late on the Thursday evening even into the Friday morning they arrested him and they arrested him as he was coming out of or in the garden at Gethsemane and they had to take him maybe a kilometre to the high priest's villa Mark himself is probably the young man with the linen cloth that we read about in verses 51 and 52. That's what people think. That's, what, that, that's why commentators think that that little statement is in there. Mark is writing the gospel, just giving us a little glimpse that he was there. And um, obviously it didn't work out so well for him. And that night somebody uh, grabbed his, his uh, cloth and he had to run off naked. But but Peter is the only one that follows uh, Jesus into the high priest's, uh, towards the high priest's villa. And then as they get there, I, I, I want to look at this under, under three headings, uh, really. First of all, Christ in the dock, how they try to put Jesus into, uh, 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 into the dock and put him under trial. And then Christ on the throne, he, he, uh, uh, makes a statement that teaches us that he won't always be in the dock, but he will one day be on the throne. And then just to, to keep those little phrases together, so Christ in the dock, Christ on the throne, and Peter on the fence. Because at this point in Peter's life, it would seem that he's a little unsure of where his loyalty uh, really lies. And so those three things, Christ in the dock, Christ on the throne, and Peter on the fence. And then I'll just ask you, I'll ask you a time or two as we go through this, how you see Jesus. But 
uh, we, 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 we need to come to a point of decision uh, toward the end. So Christ in the dock then is presumably in an upstairs room because Peter is described as being in the courtyard below. And you can just imagine Jesus there, just himself, no disciples with him. And this hostile crowd of accusers, pompous people, chief priests, elders and scribes and the whole Sanhedrin. Now, if the whole Sanhedrin were there, that was about 70 people, all vying for his life, all circling on him like vultures. Who were the Sanhedrin? Well, they were a group charged with mediating between native Jews and the Romans, a kind of uh, local or national police uh, managing religious and civil disputes uh, up, 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 up to a certain threshold. I suppose. But the thing was that they had already decided on the verdict. They, they, they weren't really bringing him in for a trial. They were bringing him in to, uh, to pin something on him, anything on him, to see if they could quieten him, to see if they could kill him, to see if they could get him out of the way because they weren't comfortable with him. They just wanted to rush through the process. A way back as early as Mark chapter 2, which would have been a couple of years beforehand, the Pharisees took issue with Jesus. You can see them beginning, to, their heckles beginning to be raised at that point. Jesus was forgiving the paralytic his sins. He was taking the place of God and being able to say to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus was dining with tax collectors and sinners. And of course, that was an affront to these Pharisees. He was healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, and that was the last straw for them at that point. And it says in, in chapter 3, verse 6 of Mark, that the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel, chatted among themselves and with the Herodians, trying to figure out how they could destroy him, trying to figure out how they could discredit him. And so they had been working at this for a couple of years, wondering how they could get, uh, how, how, the, how they could be done with Jesus. It, it, uh, as I say, it, it wasn't a fair trial. It was a kangaroo court. You, you know the idea where the, where the jury jumps over the weight of evidence. There is a weight of evidence, but they don't want to pay heed to that weight of evidence. And so they just jump over it to reach a quick judgment. It's interesting that they didn't even abide by their own rules. According to the Mishnah, a Jewish legal book from this time, if someone was being tried and it was... Uh, a, and the, the, the consequence was to be capital punishment. The, the trial should have been conducted over two days. The sittings were to take place in the daytime. And the witnesses to be, were to be warned against rumour or hearsay. And everything, therefore, according to their own rules, is wrong. This is not happening even in one day. It's happening in the dark of the night, in the middle of the night the middle of the night with, with uh, the execution to happen just the following day. And there's lots of stories being fired around, but none of them seem to agree. And so it's an unjust trial. It's a hurried and messy affair. They didn't give Jesus a hearing because they had already decided on the verdict. You see... They ask questions of Jesus, but they don't listen to the answers. The high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am. They're basically asking him, are you the savior? Are you the Messiah? And he said, I am. He tells them the truth, but they won't listen. Because they had already made up their mind. I just want to ask you at the beginning of this, at this point in your life, I want to ask you, will you give Jesus a hearing? Or, or have you already decided on the verdict? You see, these guys were scared of what it would cost them. If Jesus really was who he said he was, they would have to humble themselves. 
They were in the business of offering sacrifices at the temple. It was a lucrative business and it brought a lot of glory to them. But if they were to admit that Jesus was the final sacrifice for sins, there would be no longer any need for a high priest. And there would be no longer the same role for them or the same position for them. But you see, if Jesus was who he said he was, it was a threat to their way of life. And their lives would never be the same again if they uh, bowed to what he was saying and accepted it. And you know, there's similar parallels for us in admitting who Jesus is. If Jesus really is the king of all the earth, and we admit that, our lives will never be the same again. Our lives would have to change. And so what we prefer to do Rather than to admit who he is and have to wrestle with what the reality of that's going to look like in our lives. But what we prefer to do is to get rid of him somehow. Is to cast him aside as they were trying to do. Is to silence him. Even as he spoke they talked over him. As he spoke they wouldn't listen to him. And when we think back to those days, it sounds abhorrent. And it sounds vulgar and ugly, what they did to Jesus. But you know, the same thing happens Sunday after Sunday. And event after event in our respectable 21st century culture. Because people come to church... Maybe to please their mum. Maybe to please someone else. But they come to church and they shut their ears. They think on the night before. They think on the roast dinner that they're going to enjoy whenever they get out of the place. They think on the football of the previous day or the football of that afternoon coming. They, they flip through the photos on their phone. And Jesus speaks. Sunday after Sunday, event after event. Messages like this. And perhaps something of the cost is considered. And it's reckoned that it's too high. It's reckoned that it's just better to silence Jesus. It's better to keep him as a historical figure rather than have to wrestle with what it means for him to be the king of all the earth just now. Oh, I wonder. I wonder even today would Jesus speak to you afresh and I wonder would perhaps you listen as you've never listened before. I wonder, would you count the cost of what it would be for you to accept what Jesus says about himself? Maybe you've lived on a, maybe you have operated as a critic on the sidelines and you've enjoyed being a commentator on the church, but not part of it. You've enjoyed perhaps being a critic of what other Christians are like. And that's been your position to this point. I wonder would you prepare, be prepared to swap places and stop being the critic and come in and, and listen to this Jesus and receive this Jesus that you might become part of the church. Maybe Sunday morning to this point has been your time to sit down at home and quiet and a moment's peace with the Sunday papers. But I wonder if God would ask you to consider again the claims of Christ. Oh, it's one option just to try and silence him and shut him out. That's what they were doing. But it's not a good idea. You see, they each had their own theories and none of them agreed to look at it in a slightly different way. It says many testified falsely 
about him, but their statements did not agree. They couldn't even agree with themselves as they were bringing forth these challenges to Jesus. And you know, it's still the same today. There are many theories about Jesus, but none of, but, but none of them correlate, none of them agree. The atheist argues that if Jesus was a man, that, sorry, the atheist argues that Jesus was just a man, if he even existed at all. There is an overwhelming weight of evidence for the resurrection, but they prepare to shut their ears. They prepare to silence it. They prepare to just keep his, uh, Jesus as a historical figure. They'll embrace the Big Bang Theory. Those scientists are quite assured of the fact that the gaps in the Big Bang Theory are so vast that, an, that some sort of an intelligent designer is needed to plug those gaps. And of course, the many religions that divert the attention of people across this globe, none of them agree either. You see, lies give us something to satisfy our minds as we listen to Jesus. It's almost like the concept that's what's happening in this trial there. They have already decided what they think and they're not going to listen. But by throwing their own ideas at it, it's just enough to silence the voice of Jesus till they get him out of the way. And we use our own ideas. And if you're needing another theory to keep you going for a little longer, to forget about Jesus, for a little while longer, go onto the internet and you'll find lots of different theories and lots of different religions and lots of different thoughts about uh, uh, philosophies of life. But the crucial matter is that Jesus is the Son of the Blessed. He is the Son of God. He is the author of truth. He is the way, the truth and the life. They didn't give him a hearing. They knew if they accepted what he was saying, it would mean humbling themselves. And so all they could do was dream up lies to divert attention. And then they got bold. They got bolder still. Up until this point, it would seem that they're just treating him with words. But then they got bolder and they spat on him. They blindfolded him. They struck with their fists. Oh, I find that, you know, <laughs> I find that the strangest thing about the incarnation, about the coming of the Lord Jesus. When you think of it, when you think of who Jesus is and where he was before he came, when you think of the grandeur of heaven, when you think of the loving community of which he was a part part of the Trinity from before all time began. When you think of what Jesus enjoyed, I find it uh, unfathomable almost that he would come into this world at all. But while, while you see him earlier on in the gospel accounts, walking through cornfields with his disciples on the Sabbath, chewing on corn, it seems... Um, reasonable. But in a scene like this, when these pompous guys bring him in and they throw their accusations at him, and then they get so bold as to, as to beat him and to slap him and to cover his eyes, to mock him, to spit on him. Well, I, I, I don't know how you cope with that. But I find that very strange. I find that just hard to get my head around. And yet, that's exactly what he went through in this scene, and of course, much worse on the cross. You see, what they were doing was they were putting Jesus in the dock. 
they were saying, we don't need to listen to what you have to say, Jesus. We have it all worked out for ourselves. They were saying, we're in charge around here and you'll do what we say. And they made their decisions based on lies. I need to ask you, what are you doing with Jesus? You might not be physically spitting at him. In fact, I'm fairly sure you're not. But what are you doing with him? Have you put him in the dock and tried to silence him? Have you tried these years of your life to try and kill him off even, that you wouldn't have to listen anymore to his voice? Have you crossed the road to avoid him? Do you shut your ears when you hear word of him? Do you spout abuse at Christians? Because, because of what they believe and yet you know it's true, but you're not prepared for the cost of it. Christ, Christ in the dark. It's a strange scene, but it gives us, it's, it's an historic account. And yet it's been going on from that day till this, when people throw their insults at Jesus, but will not listen to him. But that's not the only picture that we have of Jesus in this portion of scripture. Because They ask him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And see what he says. It's partly drawing on Psalm 110. It's partly drawing on Daniel 7, I think it is. Excuse me. He says, I am and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. As I was saying to the children earlier on. See, the high priest asks him this, and what are we getting here? We're getting a picture, not of Christ on the dock, but of Christ on the throne. Jesus didn't stay on the floor, taking hits. He went on to Calvary. And there he died for these very people who derided him. The blows of these days did not destroy him forever. He, he was not forever beaten down. Like a boxer that was knocked down and then got up again to win the fight. Jesus got up again. He was raised. He, he went to Calvary to do his, to complete his life's work. He was raised to life. As I say, one of the most uh, verifiable facts in all of history. He, he wasn't just raised to life, but he ascended to the Father's right side. And Stephen saw him there, Acts 7, uh, 56. I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And as it says here, he's coming back again. Matthew 25 says, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. You see how the positions are reversed? In the gospel, he's described as the suffering servant and he was the suffering servant. And none more so than in this account that we have just read when they did their worst to him, spitting upon him, and yet he takes that because he has come to serve us. He came to suffer and to die to save us. That's, that, that was his work. But it's not how the story ends, you see. He becomes the exalted king. He becomes the reigning ruler. And when he comes, 
on the clouds of heaven. He will sit on the seat of judgment. He will sit in the, in the he, he will take the position of the judge. And then forever, in the glorious new world that he's preparing for us, he will reign as its king, sitting with his father. And those who once derided him will stand before him. That's, that is the, the strangest of paradoxes in this passage. Back then, they were in the position of power accusing him with unjust evidence. But he teaches them and tells them, listen boys, it won't always be like this. The one who's on the, on the floor, the one that you've tried to put in the dock, will one day sit on the throne and you'll be in the dock. And he won't be working with bits and pieces of evidence that don't agree. He will have all the evidence to present and there will be no contradictions. And the only hope that there will be for the likes of these priests and the likes of you and I who have spent at least a portion of our lives rebelling against him and doing our own thing, the only hope that there was for them is that they might have been found those men um, among that company mentioned in Acts chapter 6 where it says, um, I forget the exact language, but a company of the priests became obedient to the faith. And our only hope will be on that day that we have trusted in this one who didn't open his mouth but was wounded for our transgressions. And so as we stand before him, he'll own us as his own and we'll be safe on judgment day because the Christ that was once in the dock will be on the throne. I wonder again, where are you at with Jesus? Have you put him in the dock? Do you treat him as one to be silenced? Would you rather he would just die than take control of your life? Or is it possible that you have already recognized that he is on the throne already and that you will, and therefore you recognize him as king and lord of your life and you will, you will serve him. You will live for him. You will walk in his way because you've come to realize that he is the king. You know, as we react and as our society reacts to COVID-19, we will fall into one of two camps. There really only is two camps. Those who will put Jesus in the dock and those who will, who realize he's on the throne and hide or trust in him as the great and sovereign ruler. You can start, you can do one of two things these days. You can start arguing with God and you can try to accuse him and you can try to ply him with all sorts of questions as to why this thing has come and what this is all about and you can ask him a more general question about why we have to die but his answer will be the same that we die because of sin and yet he will reach out to you, his hands with the nail prints in them, and he will explain to you, if you'll listen to him, that he has provided a solution. 
He has provided a way out of this plight. He has done his bit. He has lived and died for our sins. And he reigns today as the king, as evidence and proof that his work was accepted. And you can come to him. Will you silence him? Will you try to kill him off? Or will you rest confident in the knowledge that he is on the throne and that you are his child? Christ in the dock, Christ on the throne, and just briefly, Peter on the fence. When Jesus was put in the dock, it says that Peter was warming himself at the fire with the guards. And these guards were presumably the same crowd that took Jesus and beat him. Peter has this period in his life where, where the wheels come off the wagon, so to speak, and uh, he's, he's sitting on the fence, the flickering dim light of a fire and Peter sitting in the smoky shadows with, with uh, Jesus going under trial, paints a poor picture of him at this time in his life. Seems like he has one foot in the world and, and a glance towards Jesus. I just want to ask you. Maybe you don't like the idea that I would say that there's just two camps. Those who recognize Jesus as Lord and those who accuse Jesus and uh, try to silence him. And maybe you're asking the question, is there not some middle way? Maybe you're in a position like Peter where you're kind of sitting on the fence. Wanting just to fit in with our secular society most of the time. Wanting to fit in with a group of family and friends. Scared of what it would be to be fully identified as with Jesus. That, that, that I have to tell you is a sad place to be. And it's an unsustainable place. You cannot sit on the fence forever. Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Pro Peter probably thought he'd be okay. But from this compromised position, he went on to deny the Lord. Just want to, I suppose, warn you. It doesn't seem the right word, but it probably is, you'll never be a Christian sitting on a fence. You can't, you can't just sort of roll into church once a fortnight on a Sunday night and think you're doing Christianity. If you want to be a Christian, you'll have to be all in. You'll have to go for it. You'll have to forsake and follow. If Peter was going to be right with God, he'd have to leave the fire and the friends around it and he'd have to throw his lot in with Jesus. And if you want to be a Christian, you'll have to leave the ties behind that bind you to a world where Jesus is silenced and forgotten and be united to him where you recognize that he's Lord and King of your life. Nobody can come to Jesus on their own terms. There's no such thing as a prenuptial agreement where we can bring in a little bit and kind of have a half in between sort of life with him. It's either all or nothing. Christ in the dock. Christ on the throne. And Peter on the fence. Where are you? At the very least... Can I ask you, can I encourage you? Thank you for listening today. Can I encourage you to go on, to keep on giving Jesus a hearing? Go to church and listen. Keep tuning in. Read the Bible. Ask a Christian if they'd read it with you. Please don't try to silence the voice of Jesus. He speaks to you in love, you know. He's not trying to torment you. He's trying to lead you towards what is good for you. But I want you to remember, even though people can use the name of Jesus as a swear word today, 
even though people seemingly can get through life not too bad without paying much attention to Jesus, I want to remind you that, that the one who was once in the dock, the one who was once on the floor of this kangaroo court, is already on the throne today. And if COVID-19 takes you, or some other thing takes you in 10 years' time, or 20 years' time, or 50 years' time, you will meet this one that uh, describes himself as sitting at the seat of power and glory. I encourage you to forsake all and choose Jesus and choose him today. Peter didn't stay sitting on the fence. After Jesus was raised from the dead, he said to Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, to tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee. And you know there's a little bit at the end of Mark's gospel and it says, um, tell the disciples and Peter. And of course, Jesus made his way to Galilee and Peter made his way to Galilee. And you have that beautiful scene in John 21 where Peter was restored. And he went on to preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Many people came to faith. Peter was no longer ashamed, but stood before a large crowd and proclaimed the gospel and spent the rest of his life proclaiming the gospel. And these priests, some of these priests, as I say, went on to, to be transformed to Acts 6 and 7, says a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And I just want to encourage you that, that you can experience the same change. You can go from, from being embarrassed to be as um, embarrassed as uh, before Jesus and wanting to silence him and wanting to kill him off and wanting nothing to do with him. Through the gospel, you can be made new whereby you delight to be his child and to sit under his authority. Christ in the dock. Christ on the throne. And Peter on the fence. But he doesn't stay on the fence. He comes down on Jesus' side. He uh, finds a place as part of the family of God goes on to serve the Lord for the rest of his life. And so he need not fear the day when he stands before the one on the throne because he's part of the family and the same can be true for you too. Let me just pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Help us in the midst of this strange season of life not to forget Easter, but to prepare ourselves for it, to remember the death of our Lord as we would at other years. And though perhaps our patterns for Easter will be different this year, still the event is the same. And what it signifies stands for all time. It's the very thing we need just now. We need somebody that would die in our place. And we need to know that there's new life for us, for the whosoever would come to Christ. And so we pray for help uh, to, to celebrate and to enjoy Easter again this year, knowing that it's the very essence, the very substance of our hope. Uh, so Lord, we thank you for your help again this morning as we've gathered uh, in our separate places and we pray for your blessing in the rest of our day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for, for tuning in. Uh, may the Lord bless you in the rest of your Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Um.